All right, hello everybody. Um, so our final session of the day is the Games for Education and Capstone courses. Uh, so Tim and I are each gonna introduce our individual units here. Uh, so I taught uh, Games for Education, those on camera, hi, I'm Chris Totten. Uh, I taught Games for Education, and Games for Education is a course that uh, has students work in a sector of the games industry called serious games, which is creating games that are not just pieces of entertainment, but have some piece of real world impact. So uh, education, training, advocacy, uh, persuasion, things like that. Now, I usually let students come up with their own problems in the world that they want to address through their game. However, this semester we had kind of an uh, interesting opportunity that I jumped on. The Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. ran a competition for games that taught uh, in the area of civics. So basically how the government works and, and topics like that. So students each were part of this competition. Uh, they had a number of constraints related to that. So all the games you're seeing are web playable, so playable on the internet, uh, often with uh, simple mouse or keyboard controls and you know using sort of like simple educational visual language. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of what the, the games are about. Um, and they can talk about more of the uh, opportunities and challenges that presented. Um, but that's basically what we're doing for this semester is uh, some really cool educational civics games that teach us about how our government works. And hi, I'm Tim Fritz, and I had this semester's section of Senior Capstone. And the Senior Capstone projects you'll see are, uh, they start out as a research paper project where they have to dig into some question or topic that uh, they want to use to inform their project that they start, and then they have about 10 weeks to implement their project. So the games and or animations you're gonna see are only a 10-week project that they had to uh, work through all the project management and scope management aspects uh, that come along with those creative projects. All right, <clears throat> so take it away. Hi, I'm Sam Vogel. I worked on the minigame level design. I worked on coding, uh, UI art assets, and music collection. Hi, I'm Amanda, and I work on the art assets. Hello, I'm Maya. I worked on art assets and the backgrounds. Hi, I'm Matt, and I worked on the town background. I'm Grayson, and I worked on the story building, the character designs, coding for our dialogue systems, and implementing our audio. Our game is a point-and-click uh, visual novel broken up with um, mini games that allow the player to gain a further understanding of the policies and protections that we as US citizens um, have been granted. And this is Septima.
so Subtima is a game that focuses specifically on the civil rights movement in the 60s, and we wanted to follow certain events that led to protections for our civil liberties, um, such as the right to vote and protections on getting to the poll and not being restricted based on education or any other um, factors. Uh, when we got into the game, we wanted to um, make sure that we weren't overstepping story-wise and delivering strictly factual information um, as we um, don't have any representation in the African-American community and we wanted to make sure that we didn't try to um, overstep and speak over their voices. Yeah, so when we worked on our research paper for this game, we actually took a survey around uh, the Kent area asking people in the black community if they experienced any uh, racial discrimination or how they felt about voter suppression in our country. And we did get a lot of responses in that section, which helped us with forming our dialogue. But we also ended up getting a lot of questions and answers about um, like sexual orientation discrimination and gender discrimination which we decided to move into adding some of that in our later sections as well as our characters applying for a job position. And we felt just adding some of these more uh, personal, well, we didn't add their personal stories, but we wanted to represent them as well in our game. Uh, for our art style, we went with a black and white with a blue tone color scheme because through art, art uh, style research, we found that historically it was common to we found um, that it was, uh, but posters were black and white with a uh, singular color uh, as a statement, because, uh, and it, but it was common blue. All of the um, backgrounds and the town map assets are hand drawn and kept fairly muted and simple, just to give the characters and the dialogue some room to breathe. Uh, there was a lot of research into what these historical locations would have actually looked like. So looking at voting locations, schools, uh, newspaper offices, uh, just to make sure everything was accurate and representing things well. So we chose to have mini games play at the end of each uh, location level because it would help give the player a break from very dialogue heavy and slower scenes. And this way the experience could feel a little more interactable and it could have a more interesting classroom experience if it would ever be played in a classroom. And each mini game is introduced through the dialogue so it kind of feels interwoven with our story. And each mini game also relates to the location they're played in. So our sliding puzzle is you're fixing a torn voting poster. And this mini game kind of just emphasizes the emotions the player and our character may be feeling after facing discrimination at the polling location. Our matching puzzle takes place in a school because matching memory games are often used to help children, you know, improve their memory. And this also helps keep the player's attention. And our maze mini game takes place in a stressful job location. And this also emphasizes the stress in the mini game because there is a timer and it is very hard to beat. And um, there's also like fast paced music and this just helps keep player engagement. Okay, so I did the art assets that are on the matching puzzle game. And for I want to talk a little about it because I decided to go a little off of the color scheme of the game. My, and I used an idea for uh, scout badges. So this assets would be more memorable since they are the the ones that goes with the facts uh, that people need to learn on our game. So uh, they are colorful, they have uh, specific people or things that were important to that fact. So I think this will be a good thing that will make people m memorize that and remember because of the colors and the, the 
uh, images that are there. So these are the, the icons that we can see like there. Um, so when it came to our um, goal for the game, uh, we wanted to focus more on grades four through nine, um, with the heaviest being uh, sixth through seventh. And um, the main inspiration behind like the mini games and the fact input is um, games like iReady that I played when I was in elementary school. And um, games like that. Um, so making sure that it was memorable for students, I talked to several teachers, um, they're my cousins, but, uh, and they all teach within like those age ranges, so they gave me advice on types of games that help with memory, and um, big ones are usually matching. Um, so further on, we definitely want to match um, facts with definitions, stuff like that, so it's more, less pictures, more like the actual facts to start. Um, so, move, Oh, sweet. I'm on the spot now. Um, <laughs> thanks. So, um, yeah, right off the bat, uh, I love the attention to the, to the source. Uh, I love the fact that you, are, you have done your research in consulting people in education to find out what is going to be good for the age range that you are attempting to deliver this to. Um, coupled with the fact that you're in games for education, so you're working under you know the criteria there, I think that's very successful. The one thing of, of feedback that I would like to give is I don't almost feel like a sense of accomplishment going through these mini games. I feel like a lot of times I'm kind of hit with a fact afterwards. Um, and just keep in mind that you have a younger audience, so maybe that sense of accomplishment with like a kind of a reward or, or some kind of graphic or something that they can kind of have that sense of, okay, I've accomplished this task and then hit them with the fact, right? Couple that, time that, I think that'd be really good. And then my piece of feedback was, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> having, so first of all, like, I really love what you approached and, and how you are bringing it in. Like, as you said, you don't have representation from this community in your group, but you made sure you worked with that community. And that's, I mean, that's just like ethical game design. You are practicing ethical game design, which is like really important. Um, but then the other thing that uh, I would say, be careful of when you when you set something in the 60s, do a lot of work to make sure the outfits match. That the outfits seem sort of out of time. Like you have that poll worker, and he's like, he looks like a, you know, like a six, 17 year old dude in a t-shirt. It's like I don't know if that would be a poll worker. Um, so yeah, I kind of like what the in our town, you know, you had all that, that amazing visual reference. Try to bring some of that mindset into it, too. Um, because I think that will really make it seem like a period history piece. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Good job. Yeah. All right. Next group. Do you know who's next? Uh, I, mean, I have to start the open. I was going to say, yeah. yeah. Let me open. Okay. I, I can. Yeah. I'll do the spreadsheet. Okay. I'm Jerry Kinder, and I was the game director. I'm Justice Fike, and I did game research. I'm Kayla Yuri, and I was the game programmer. My name is Leah Mosier, and I did the art assets. I'm Grayson Thralls, and I did sound design.
As you saw in the trailer, Correct Court is a game that teaches you how to navigate the legal system and find the right court for your case. Uh, whether that's uh, uh, figuring out your family will, uh, getting out of a speeding ticket, or just trying to defend yourself from a critical charge, Correct Court will guide you through the process. You also learn about different types of courts and rules and procedures that they follow. And, doing, uh, and while playing the game, you interact with your client and ask questions regarding their case. And in doing so, you will explore the dialogue options and expand upon the world building that we made. And we hope to show off how we combined education, simulation, and comedy to make learning about law fun and engaging. We had two games that greatly inspired our design and gameplay for Correct Court. The main inspiration for our game was called Court Quest. It was an educational game teaching you about which different courts dealt with which kind of cases. And we believed it was lacking in the gameplay department uh, by not letting the players explore the cases and people you're talking to. It focused mainly on just the educational part. So we. Uh, looked to another game, we looked to Ace Attorney for our gameplay, and by having the player ask different questions and make different decisions to help decide which to answer to choose for the correct conclusion, and we believed combining these two aspects of the games together would make a more enjoyable educational experience for the player. Our game Correct Court uh, first began as a paper prototype to get a feel for the overall design layout and narrative progression of the game. From there, we were able to further refine and flesh out the game's mechanics, story, and pathing upon implementing that foundation of the game into our prototyping engine, Twine. Upon receiving feedback from playtesters, we utilized these findings to then export our Twine version into our game's cho chosen engine, Unity, to further enhance our previously developed uh, foundation as well as build upon our overall design and plot progression. We wanted to write court to simulate what it would feel like to be in an actual lawyer's court, so we researched many images of lawyers' offices and buildings that they would work in. We also took inspiration from iCivic's character designs to give each and every character a unique design to tell, tell each other apart. So when we started concepting Correct Court, we had realized that it could be a helpful educational tool. When testing the game, we gave our players surveys after they played to see what aspects we could improve upon and how well the game did work as an educational tool. 80% of our testers felt that they did learn something from the game. And one of our testers, who is an education major, had said that it was a beneficial tool that could be used to incorporate into a lesson plan. We could see Correct Court being used in a classroom setting to teach about the courts and laws. The game narrows down the choices for the players so that the questions they've already picked aren't playable more than once. This will actually force students or players to progress through the game. This feature shortens the game's play time, which would be helpful to a teacher trying to get a lesson plan done in a timely manner. And we open, open up for questions. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, just starting off, I really like the concept of kind of just uh, using some very, uh, just like getting glimpses of the dialogue that you had in there. It looked very, uh, drawing a blank here, it looked very appealing, like very, uh, a lot of personality in how you wrote that dialogue. Um, and like when you mentioned that Ace Attorney was one of your like big inspirations behind going for like this visual novel s style, I perked up because I was like, oh, I love those games. So, um, and like the one thing that I wanted to really see more of, it might it might just be like how you set up the trailer. In is that um, I want to know like exactly what. Um, how the player is supposed to learn the knowledge that they're applying when they are, you know, interviewing the people and they choose what court they need to go to. Like, where do you learn that knowledge and, and um, like, when do you need to apply it later, basically? So, uh, when you get the question wrong, it'll explain why you got it wrong and it'll tell you what that, what court, because you 
when you pick a court, it'll tell you what that court is and what it does, and you have a chance to go back and uh, pick a different one to see if you got that one right. Okay. Yeah, uh, so one thing that I, I would like to kind of bounce off of that um, is it f was very hard to actually, and this is just the trailer format, I'm sure when, when somebody's actually playing the game and moving at their own pace, it's a much different experience. However, one of the things as an audience looking into this is, is it's very hard to tell when the question is actually incorrect or correct without speed reading the dialogue. Right, um, I feel like there was design space to maybe show emotion in the characters' faces when a question is wrong to kind of reinforce the idea that you've gotten this wrong, you've gotten this correct, and moving down, you know, whatever, whatever it is that that player's story has to tell. Maybe it's a positive reaction, maybe it's a negative, but something artistically could change to complement the the feeling of dopamine that should be received upon getting it right, and then obviously the feeling of okay, I need to go back and study this because I'm not going to pass the test. I saw the Twine page at the beginning. Did you guys start off in Twine and move to Unity, or did you guys somehow combine the two? So when we first started, we actually had a paper prototype to go through and make sure that the design layout was going to flow well with our game and follow the scope that we had in the time that we had to make the game. And then we went into Twine to fix the branching and responses and write the story based on that, and then we implemented it into Unity. Um, was there a design decision behind just the floating heads, or why don't can we get bodies? <laughs> to be honest, we wanted to focus more on the characters' faces and their, and when they talk rather than the bodies. I, I think I think you have the opportunity too to like like design it because like you're seeing the back wall and then the t you see the head, then the back wall, then the text. Like there's a disconnect there. I'm like I'm disconnected. So if you want to do that, I think it's fine, but you still need something to connect the character. To like the text box, then that that's probably the way to do that. Um, okay. Yeah. It's time, Mike. Okay, we got one minute left. Anyone else? No. Well, I guess that's it for time then. Uh, hi, my name is Jai Amos. Uh, I was the uh, production lead. I worked on uh, some of the background art, the overall UI flow, and the music as well. Hi, I'm Emma Bashton. I did a lot of the UI design, background scenes, and the case writing. Hi, I'm Andrew Thomas. I worked on the character portraits and programming all the buttons. A uh, little tug of with the uh, trailer video. Um, but this is the uh, early concept design for like the UI flowchart and a snippet of our transformational framework. Uh, this helped to uh, inform us of how we wanted the game to overall flow and how we wanted it to uh, feel moving forward. Uh, this was actually brought up on uh, a lot of Q&A testing with paper prototypes with actually students from high schools. So I was able to get some good feedback from juniors and seniors. And this is uh, some screenshots from our macro sheet, which helped uh, with those, that feedback from juniors and seniors. I was able to get a good idea of what the overall feeling and content that the game should involve uh, during the selection phases and during the actual, what we call the live case scene, where individuals are uh, debating a case. Um, this is kind of like our 
start to finish from Perforce. Uh, the very beginning uh, involved a lot of setting down uh, slots uh, in Unity, so that way once finished assets were uh, completed, we could pretty much set them in. And the overall game itself, uh, the trailer for some reason didn't play through uh, properly, or it didn't export, but the overall game is uh, you play as the jury in a courtroom, and you have to decide who is uh, guilty and who isn't in a set of cases. So when coming up with the art design, we obviously started off with just sketches and then it later developed into our full like background. And with the age being around 13 to 16 of the like, or 13 to 18, I guess, with like middle to high schoolers, this is like serious quote unquote material just because um, some cases do involve like assault, some weapons, but nothing too crazy to scare them off or anything. So a light, fun background and art style helps uh, balance it out well. And also with um, writing the cases, I wanted to make sure the information given wasn't too, too much. Um, so I left it up for interpretation just because we are gonna have the students, you know, discuss with one another to like to see who could be guilty and not guilty. And I didn't want to make it one-sided. Um, I wanted it for everyone to have a good debate in class. So a big influence for kind of the art style for my character portraits was uh, daytime court television, such as Judge Judy, Judge Steve Harvey, and Judge Joe Brown. Uh, so I wanted the characters to kind of reflect the cheesiness and campiness of those TV shows and uh, all I did when making them was I got references online and decided to trace over them for a rotoscoped feel. And along with uh, doing the char character portraits, I also programmed the buttons. Uh, due to the strengths of our team, programming was a challenge for all of us, but even with those constraints, we were able to accomplish our goals. Uh, we used old programs from past Unity projects and made new code like our timer and have it even work with our mid-deliberation evidence. Uh, and our buttons also moved to different scenes, which lead us to having over 60 scenes within our Unity project. Any questions? Not bad. I noticed the timer right before they passed the verdict. Is this supposed to be a timed game to build a sense of challenge and pressure? Uh, so yes, uh, due to the scope of the uh, <laughs> team skill, uh, we weren't able to set the proper blueprinting for that ahead of time. The timer you did see, however, was set for the mid-deliberation evidence. So this is kind of like our ace, ace attorney's version of objection. So the mid-deliberation evidence is kind of some new information that would generally shake up whatever verdict that the jury was going to decide on. Uh, and that timer is set to uh, kind of delay the deliverance of that evidence. Thank you. Hi, so um, quick question. So. How do you see this implemented in a classroom setting? Do you see this as like the teacher sitting in the class down, them playing together, an individual? So uh, the order of operations of the video is a little scattered, so I ended up not getting to this. But the overall inspiration was from this was a general uh, Jackbox Kahoot style. So this would definitely be used in a kind of uh, higher end civics class, much like junior, senior year, where uh, students are allowed to debate uh, topics and rules freely. So this is definitely something that a teacher could put on for maybe half of their class or maybe a whole class and just take a day on uh, the overall topics. Because we did actually grab these from the Library of Congress's website. So while the context has been changed, uh, all of the rules and all of the uh, places uh, in court proceedings generally tie in with things that have already happened uh, in the real world. OK. 
Okay. Taking into consideration the the uh, what you said, like your your specialities are, and the fact that you didn't have a programmer, um, I I will say though one of the things that I think would be super beneficial would be to kind of have mechanics that are complementary to that setting. If you had kind of like for the timer, for instance, that could be something that a teacher, a mediator could keep track of, and if the discussion should go longer because they feel as though their class is learning, why limit that discussion based off the mechanics of your game, right? Like, allow the, the teacher to teach at their pace and make them feel in control because that's the format of that. And likewise, too, I think maybe tools that would help the student if they could pull up the document and maybe even highlight that just on the page or something like that, that allows them to kind of like debate this information. and it. And it allows them to take it out of the game. And that's not something that a lot of times we have to design for is what happens in the room. But when you look at a Jackbox or a Kahoot style game that is very that is very real to the game, you have to think of outside of the constraints of the computer with people actually talking. Yeah, and, and that actually gives me a segue to some of the pieces of feedback I was gonna give. Um, now I know, so first of all, again, it sounds, if I'm picking this up correctly, like it's a part of the trailer didn't render out. So like, first of all, kudos for you all like holding it together during that. Like that's really well done. So like, good job, you know, poker face, yay. Um, uh, so along those lines, um, yeah, I think one, so one, watch the trailer before you like put it into the, it's just like always check your, check it before you submit. You know, just like give yourself that backstop. Um, and I know you're under crunch, but like just always make sure you check that um, to avoid those kind of like presentation things. Uh, the other thing is, I think, uh, yeah, a few other places talking about, you know, you're designing the way that people interact even more than you're designing like a game. Because your game's like, you know, we talked about this. It's really a tabletop game that has a digital component that mediates it because that's the requirements of what Library of Congress wanted. Um, so I think that's where like more footage of people playing it, more, you know, even if you have to like fake it, because uh, I know you got some playtest footage that we've seen throughout the semester, like even if you kind of set it up where you have like you, the three of you get together and like, you know, pantomime arguing, fine. Like, but that would, I think that would really make it stick so that, you know, throughout the whole presentation, especially at the end when you see the, the choice, like that was a very nice little pantomime, like, you know, mouse goes back and forth. I think if you cut it with like footage of you being like, you know, it, like yelling at each other, I think that would have really sold it. It's like 45 seconds or less. Anyone else? Oh, I got time for one last question. Yeah, so obviously you guys had requirements for the project overall and, and meeting the, uh, the game requirements. But I actually kind of do agree that this might benefit a lot from being a tabletop experience. Um, you could still have a digital component of it. So if you know, um, there's like certain games, like I forget what it's called, but it's like uh, Midnight Werewolves or something like that, where it's a, it's a uh, tabletop game, but it has an audio component to it that you can play through your phone. So you could totally have it where maybe the cases are read aloud by some sort of audio component to it while still facilitating most of the conversation to be having be occurring in like a board game setting. Um, I think that this sort of game would really benefit from that. Hello, this is our game, I Got Arrested. It is a visual novel guiding you through the process of getting arrested. You're driving down the highway when it happens. Those red and blue flashing lights appear behind you, making your heart race in surprise if nothing else. What are you thinking? I don't know what to do. If only there were some kind of 
legal aid fairies that could help me, or something. No matter what nervous concern you're experiencing, there they are. Two small women with wings and business suits? trailer for our game. Um, as you can see, I was the project lead. My name is Kylie Fiala. Um, I was the project lead and the main programmer for the game. All right, then my name is Autumn Lewis. I was the main QA tester as well. I did the sound assets as well. Uh, my name is Sean Dote and I was the lead artist on the game. My name is Nicholas Hansen and I did most of the document, most of the paperwork and some minor video editing. And I'm Ray Thornton, I was the lead writer and I worked on the character sprites. Um, so right now we're showing the original prototype of our game, which I did as a Google form, uh, going back to my days of playing uh, visual novels in Quizilla, if you're old enough to remember Quizilla. Um, and basically we just used it as a good way to get Q&A feedback, because it was really easy, people just submitted their answers. At the end we had a survey and people submitted their answers through that survey. And for the way for me to get the QA testing out, I just basically saved the link to my phone and I sent it out to as many people as, in, as I knew, like my coworkers, my family, my friends, my boyfriend's friends. And I sent it out to over 20 people, but I only ended up getting like 15 responses on the first one that we had. And then Uh, and this is the concept art of the legal aid fairies themselves. I based them on two popular figures in media that are lawyers. On the left, we have Mel Forrest, who is based on Elle Woods from Legally Blonde, and on, sorry, on the right. And then on the left, we have uh, Sue Jung Soo, who is based on uh, Sue from uh, Extraordinary Attorney Sue. Uh, so for the rest of the artwork in the game, um, the sprites came first, so uh, we based the rest of the artwork on the art style of those sprites. So we went for this more like kind of cartoonish, like not like super serious, but uh, it's still like eye catching at the same time. And the current image that we have up is a screenshot of the first soundtrack that we have for the background music. And I used pre made soundtracks and I created it into my own soundtrack. So for all of the programming, I use the program Twine. Um, as you can see, I don't know if the projector's cutting it off, but as you can see, uh, all the buttons and the text box at the bottom is done through Twine, and we just have our um, background art mainly being the center of attention other than the two fairies being on screen when they're speaking at the same time. Um, we made sure that four of the fairies, when they're speaking, one of them would be grayed out just so we had more clarification on the screen. Now it's a little hard to see because of the dark mode I had it, but this was the first version of Twine. We don't have that much story in at that point. We also have all of the text on the screen, so every time it pulled up, it was a, a bunch of story text. So the latest and cur current version of Twine is every single piece of storyline being separated. Um, due to the way that I learned how Twine works, the only way I could get the text to pull up in the reasonable amount, it was a separate scene for each passage. It was a definitely a great learning experience and I um, believe the Twine helped us out a lot. Okay, and now we are open for questions. Yeah, that was really good timing. Um, so, bit of a bit of two comments here. Um, first one is when you're presenting the game, we didn't really get a sense of like 
what it is through the elevator pitch. Like, we saw the title, I Got Arrested, right? But we weren't really too sure, at least across here, like, what's going on? Like, obviously, we got arrested, but, like, and that's when all the scenarios started to click, and as you went through the presentation and all that, all these things clicked, right? But be a little bit more direct on the elevator presentation just in that beginning. Uh, the second bit is I love the fact that you did some Q&A prior to the game actually coming out. I think that is so smart on so many levels. It not only allows you to give something out to the public to see how these things are going to be reviewed, but it also gives you guys as designers of scenarios to expect based off of what questions are answered incorrectly. And I absolutely love that that was done. I think that needs to be done a lot more often when the format allows for it. Yeah, just to reiterate the prototyping point, like prototype under any circumstances, like that you used a Google form, great. Like <clears throat> you, PowerPoint is a game engine if you use it the right way, right? So like just kudos for being really inventive, not thinking like it has to be a certain thing. Um, I just want to make the comment that I love the legal aid fairies. It's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Justin has a question. Uh, yeah, really nice job. I think there's some really good aspects in there. And again, love the legal aid fairies. Um, I think you did have an opportunity there, though. Um, as you were in the car, to add some flashing lights, you set it, but you had the opportunity to show it. And I think once people see those lights, like everybody knows what that feels like. And I got the feeling when you said it, but if we would have seen that visually, I think that would have been a quick addition that really would have like just put the icing on the cake for that. So. Yeah, due to the constraints of Twine itself, um, I wouldn't have been able to, unfortunately, doing a, a flash animation. However, if we did have a chance to expand on this project, I would move to RunPy. RunPy is the visual novel type program that we would go to. I don't think that. I, I don't think. I don't think that that might be the best thing for Twine. I mean. There, there probably is some technical way where you code it, but but an easy solution would be add that into the art, right, as a still, so that way the, the player can communicate that, or at least knows that that's happening. And then the last thing I would say that I had a comment on is like with the trailer, um, you know, I know you kind of had some, like you had to get, get it together really quickly, um, but <clears throat> you kind of start with like the very meditative voice and very calming voice, and then it goes like dun 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 dun, dun. and then it goes like meditative again, and like the moment of the legal aid fairies coming is just so like you go back to the meditative, and I wanted it to be like you you were talking when you were talking about creating them like legally blonde and these other things, give me that, give me that like high energy like L Woods just showed up to save you, right? Uh, kind of thing, and that because that's what they look like, right? So yeah, like sell that more with the high energy, and I think that's going to make that game feel feel really good for that kind of scene. One minute. Thank you. One minute. We got one minute. Any last questions? Nope. Okay. Then we. That's a wrap. Thank you. Hello, this is our game project, Right to Assemble.
So Right to Assemble is a game where you play as a character that is dissatisfied with a certain aspect of your society. So the best way to make a change is through peacefully protest. And as you advance through each concurrent level, you see the impacts that your protest will make and the changes that the environment will have as well. So I am Steven. I am the project lead and the main programmer for the game. Uh, hi, I'm Gavin. I did the environmental art, level design, and other assets. I'm Madeline. I did the 2D art and some of the menu UI design. Um, I'm Aiden, and I did some of the general modeling. Uh, for this, we decided to do a low poly style because we had a lot we wanted to add to make it like a full 3D game. And we were only given a set time frame. So we just did some environmental aspects, low poly. And then here's some rough sketches I did for assets that we were making, and then other buildings that me and Aiden both made for the whole environment for the city. And then we also looked at a lot of reference photos of different cities, like different objects, the way trash cans can look also. And then here's the original sketch I did for how we want the city level to look. I kind of just blocked it out at first. And then I also just copy pasted like the same buildings that we already had to get the general shape. And then that was like a rough image version. And then here's the final version of the city that we had. And then there was other sketches of some buildings. We added different things like trees that are in planters, lamps, stop signs, and also textures to the road. We kind of wanted it to feel like overcooked style, like so like low poly with like flat texturing. And then here was the other level, which is the park level. Um, the rough sketches on the left, I kind of changed it a little bit by adding the gazebo in the bottom left, and I also added a whole park, as well as the city background to make it feel like you're going from the city level to the park, so you can notice that while you're playing the game. Here is the concept for the menu design and then the final version. Um, we took a screen cap from the game. I took it over into Photoshop and basically rendered 2D um, shapes over it to fit the low poly 3D style of the rest of the game. And I put the titles on the signs to give it a nice dynamic feeling. Um, here is the character that would be giving the tutorial to the player. Um, here's the first sketch and then how he turned out. Um, I don't know if you can read that. He's, he's a lot of layers because I drew each poly individually on a new layer. Um, but his job is kind of to explain the ins and outs of the rules for the game. Questions? Yeah, so uh, first of all, so I, I really commend you for going, so if you, for a few things. Now, this wasn't in your presentation, but I'm gonna give a little peek behind the curtain. Like, your idea involved crowds, but was very different in the beginning. But it wasn't like something that, <clears throat> you know, would have necessarily fit the civics theme. And, and you know, we talked about it a lot, and, and I really commend you for taking that feedback, because I think, like, you came up with something really awesome and within theme. Um, and then the other thing I want to commend you for is the, um, you know, the, uh, the 3D. Like, you know, when you get web-based as, as your spec, you know, because like this is something that happens a lot in the serious games field, is that you're working with a client, the client's going to have a spec, and that spec is not necessarily going to be always like, the most exciting, the most fun, the, the most like freeing gameplay experience. You're gonna be like, I gotta build for what? Um, so I think what you, you, you did something really smart by creating this little world with like the low poly characters. Cause you said, yeah, it's both a time thing. It's, you made a lot of really smart production choices of what this amounts to, both for delivering a cooler looking, you know, more expansive experience that, that you wanted to go for, but then also, yeah, just time saving. So I thought that was really smart. Like, so I wanted to like say, hey, good job. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, I agree with, I agree with all of that because we were talking and, and 
we, we think that it's, it's extraordinarily difficult to do 3D in a web-based application. Did you use Unity or Godot? I, I couldn't tell. I thought it was Unity. So I used Godot. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's really smart because like we were talking like if it was done in Unity, then you're restricted to the like the web browser there and, and you know, the web player on Unity is is subpar compared to what Godot is capable of. Um, and so it's it's really awesome to see such a hard thing captured this way. Um, I think that was really well done. I just love this like protest Pikmin. It's a protest Pikmin. I love it. Uh, I love the idea. I just have one small question on the gameplay side. Mm -hmm. So the objective of the game is to fill up the influence bar. Yes. Uh, is there any, uh, uh, it wasn't quite clear in the trailer, are there any other ways that we fill up the influence bars aside from just gathering a big, uh, huge crowd? So we just wanted to focus on the core gameplay, which is just talking to people and then having them join your cause. Oh, okay. Yep. What inspired you to make this game? So initially, my project pitch was on uh, crowd crushing, but then that wasn't exactly civic space, so we pivoted towards just the right to assemble. Um, yeah. And we, we like the idea that there is like strength in numbers. So like the more people you have, the more voices that'll like speak out and more people <coughs> that, and more ways that, that we, people will uh, hear your cause and make a difference. So with the gameplay, is it possible for when you walk up to someone and try and get them to join your cause, can they just say no? In current implementations of the game, no. But we plan on further adding in, like, uh, when people are in your group, we, planned, we initially planned on having them grow a little bit violent, and, and then it was your... Uh, your duty to like uh, make them calmer in your group, as to not make the protest violent, as the main goal was to peacefully protest. But in the current implementations, uh, no. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to ask, uh, since he had mentioned uh, bringing up the idea of future implementations, um, do you guys have any plans for any additional areas? Because I feel like that would be a good idea if you decide to expand on it. No. You can just say nay, Aiden. <laughs> you cannot have a plan, it's all right. Yeah. We don't have any concrete plans, but if we were, we would just add in one more level to uh, complement the park level and what they were protesting for. Yep. Um, hi, I'm Colton Ewert. I was the game designer. I'm Lily Blackwell. I did research and worked on scenarios. 
I'm Jaden Pelig, and I was the lead artist. Hi, I'm Colt Hyde, and I was a writer. Hi, I'm Madeline Losher. I was also a writer. No. <laughs> Constitutional or not, um, you play as an advisor with the goal, or an advisor for Bill of Rights related issues. Characters come to you with their problems, their scenarios in which you have to solve and delegate to decide if anybody's in the wrong. Uh, your goal is to learn about amendments, it tests your knowledge, and then we hope to teach you more. Now we're good to go. Um, the game went through many iterations during prototyping, starting with a paper prototype, and then we used Twine, and then lastly we went to Godot, where we used a plugin that matched the same kind of workflow as Twine. Um, and during the early pro protesting, we had a, a really big problem with a chocolate covered broccoli issue, where the game felt like a quiz and not like a game. The first major problem we had was because we had a quota system, which had players needing to answer a certain amount of questions correctly, which led to people quitting early if they didn't get the right amount. So we got rid of that and added in a system that um, rewarded players and told them whether or not they were correct and then why they were correct or why they weren't. And lastly, we also added a ability to question characters, which gave another gameplay, uh, added more gameplay, pretty much. All of the scenarios were based on actual court cases in the real world, which posed a unique challenge because we wanted to make sure that scenarios were challenging and compelling for the player, but not overly complicated. The process of finding these scenarios was pulling up any giant list of Supreme Court cases going through and vetting, the, picking the ones that we needed for what was good. Um, and we also had to consider the audience being younger, make sure that the scenarios, while they still taught the audience, didn't, were appropriate for them. Uh, going off the of scenarios, um, we had a giant Google Doc that we shared full of those scenarios, and um, we shared another Google Doc where we wrote dialogue, and this process involved looking at the scenarios, uh, coming up with characters for these scenarios, and coming up with the dialogue, as well as the questions that the player would ask, and then explaining whether or not um, it was constitutional or not. Uh, yeah, we were being very diligent when we were coming up with the dialogue, because the last thing we wanted was to be wrong, incorrect. Um, but thanks for the thoughtful work of our scenario writer. Uh, we use real court cases as the basis of our dialogue. And also, when we were designing the characters, we wanted to make sure they weren't, they weren't lying, being malicious, but rather they just were unaware of the amendments. So no trickery. You're just the player helping them out. And when designing the characters, well, visually, they mostly started off as just stick figures like get a baseline for what the icons would look like, then start adding more, adding more detail, making each one look visually distinct, but not over the top, if that makes sense, but more grounded. And yeah, that's really about it. Any questions? The very first impression that I got from this game was this sort of 90s Y2K computer game similar to games like 
Um, if you're familiar with um, the original Jumpstart games on PC, is that the vibe that you were going for? Or was it coincidental? Um, probably purely coincidental, because I don't think any of us were aware of that game. Um, uh, the games we based it on was Ace Attorney, and uh, not as grim, but the uh, game Papers, Please, but it's pretty far from that. <laughs> Okay, uh, one thing I, I wanted to kind of point out that I say um, applies, I saw with your project here, but kind of applies to a lot of the more visual novel style projects that I've seen is just how to handle your, uh, your big wall of text, uh, especially uh, like you said, um, you're thinking about kind of designing a game for a younger audience in mind when you have a giant wall of text, even if it's important info that somebody needs to read, it's not gonna register. Um, so usually when, uh, it, it depends on kind of your goals with what you wanna get across, but uh, usually a good way to um, make a long, uh, basically like a long paragraph of text a lot more, I guess, palatable to the player is uh, kind of segmenting it out into like at most two lines per text box, maybe two, th two to three, and just kind of keep scrolling through there so you don't have to look through pretty much everything uh, all at once. And it can e very easily cause like someone's eyes to glaze over miss important information. Another thing to worry about is making sure your, uh, uh, making sure just like your font choice is readable, especially at a distance, which, um, and that goes into the choice of the font itself, as well as how big you display it on the screen and whether it's kind of being crowded by other elements or not. Um, so definitely think about the importance of that as well. Yeah, I, I definitely echo a lot of what Scott has said here in, in choosing your font, and I mean, this is such a hard design space too, right? Because we're, we're talking about designing for, for children. And if you've looked at recent media and stuff like that, a lot of the games that are out there now, like your big games like Fortnite, Minecraft, there's always a lot of visual things going on. And it can be hard to find that balance. I think like you said, the chocolate covered broccoli, it can be hard to find that balance of delivering key information and also having fun in the game. Uh, I think there could be I think that the text medium definitely works, but I think that there still needs to be something rewarding about it, whether that reflects in the art, whether that reflects in some kind of like a war that the player is tracking or something, those, those things do need to be there. And, and one of the things that I, I, I wanna commend you on is how you took on that. So for clarity, chocolate covered broccoli refers to this idea in serious games where it's like broccoli is healthy, but people don't like it but you don't want to just cover it in chocolate because then you create something icky. And <clears throat> that's what the risk of like serious games is, is like you've covered something healthy and informative with something like a game thinking it's going to be cool, but it's just kind of weird. Um, so I like that you, I don't like that you ha had to run into it, but I like that you like thought around and be like, okay, what can we do to make this better? And then you thought, well, you know, not necessarily just adding more rewards, which is what like a lot of people do, and then it makes gamification. You did it like, <clears throat> you were like, well, what if it lets you explore? And, and what I'm seeing as a theme throughout all these projects is people are thinking of like, well, what other parts of games are fun beyond just rewards? You know, whether it's trying again, exploring the material, things like that. And I really do like that you went for that aspect of it. I think it, you know, I like that you took it head on and you're, thinking about it like a person who's in this sector would.
Hi, I'm Anna Stevenson. I did art and um, project management. Hi, I'm Jean Franco, and I worked on the assets. Hello, I'm Alex Bowling, and I did the programming. Hi, my name is Kylie. I worked on art assets and programming and asset implementation. All right, so uh, our game's focus is on the civic duty of education, and uh, this is education about not only the government, but also uh, American ways of life. And one of the backbone um, com components of our country's function are the skilled trades. Um, uh, however, it doesn't seem like a lot of education typically focuses on the trades as a viable role. Uh, so we wanted to really address that gap in education, especially because it is so important in our American society. So when it came to prototyping, we wanted to try and find specific trades that we thought would make good mini games because we were going for a very WarioWare type appeal um, with very classic fun mini games that you would want to replay. So we took a couple of trades that we had actually, um, I had known some people in real life that do some of these trades and I was able to take a couple of the uh, ones that they do and make them into those mini games. And then as well as the digital prototyping, we have um, some of that footage here as well. Uh, we wanted to obviously keep everything simple uh, going into it just to try and get the mechanics down to begin with. And it all very much so evolved very quickly after that. Uh, so I used Playmaker to make this. It's a Unity plugin. Um, it's pretty good for um, uh, make creating like simple uh, menu systems and uh, other game mechanics, which I think is a shoe in for this. Uh, these look like very, uh, I guess not, yeah, they're like kind of big like state machines, but um, in reality, this is, these are just like menu managers or like the managers that you use to navigate various mini games. Um, <clears throat> And one of the things I tried to do when I was creating this was to keep this as lightweight as possible. So I succeeded in making this all one scene by uh, making all the separate mini games their own individual uh, prefabs that spawn in when uh, it's time for them to spawn in and get destroyed when uh, you beat them. Uh. Um, so. The three of us um, all did art assets. Um, I did the backgrounds, and I wanted to focus on kind of a more detailed style to give more attention to the uh, more interactable elements, which are a lot simpler. While I did do some assets as well, I also did all of the character designs. I really wanted to focus on creating a diverse cast that you will actually see in the trades, but I feel like it is not talked about as much, especially when it comes to race or gender. Those are things that are not typically disclosed in the people that work in trades, so that was something that I really wanted to delve into whenever it came to character design. I worked on the objects as well, and um, I tried to make them fairly simple so everyone would understand what they are, because uh, some of them can, can be unfamiliar to some people. And um, we had a lot of assets to make as well. It was uh, 11 mini games. <laughs> and then finally, I did the music and sound. Um, it is an original soundtrack. Um, it's just done in GarageBand. And I took uh, variations of the main theme that was also the trailer music um, and kind of took those motifs and gradually built them as the difficulty of the game ramps up. So yeah, thank you. Your, Sorry. What was your main inspiration or your main inspirations for not just the game, but also the soundtrack and artistic direction? Um, our main inspiration for gameplay was definitely WarioWare and other games in that vein, like Rhythm Heaven and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So what we really wanted to, our biggest inspirations were like, uh, Anna mentioned WarioWare, things like Cooking Mama. Um, that was definitely the type of art style that we were going for. We felt like it would appeal to our audience a lot more being the around middle school to teen demographic because those are usually the times when you're thinking about what you want to do in, in your life or as a career. So we thought that that would be the best way that uh, we would appeal to that demographic. If that answers your question. <laughs> you said Cooking Mama? Yes. <laughs>
So first of all, I, I want to commend you on the like the package you've put together for this presentation because again, it's like how do you avoid the chocolate covered broccoli feeling? And you made a video game. You went like all in. You you know it's got like quick cuts and action and really like upbeat popping music and stuff like that. So I really love that you went for it in that way. Um, the one thing that I, I wish was there, and again, as more of like a hype thing, is like I wish I would have seen a list of the game, the, the trades that are turned into mini games, because I'm excited to play this. I feel like I'd be even more excited if I was like, what, what's, what's that like as a mini game? So I think that's that's the only thing I would say. Like, make sure you put in that stuff, because like I'm, I'm you know, like viewing it from the outside. Like I mean. I've, Played the game and everything, but it's like that would be really exciting is to see like, well, how'd they turn that into a mini game? And I think that would be really like a next step up, too. Uh, but I think I think it's great. I I love the topic of what it covers. Uh, I think that that is a really cool thing to kind of focus on, and I think also it. I feel like a lot of times, yeah, we are kind of leaning away from that, and to have a game that kind of like enforces that, and and to to kind of prep the next generation to saying, well, hang on, like let's explore other people's stories and other people's ways of life is is really cool. Um, yeah, I, I I would just say I from the trailer perspective, I want to know a bit more about the mini games. I just feel like I didn't get enough of that, but I saw a lot of the art assets, and I was seeing the art assets. And I'm like, man, I kind of want to see what that game played like. Um, so that's just a small thing, but yeah, really cool. Yeah, I was just going to say real quick um, in like response to what you said, it was definitely a home kind of project because my fiance works in trades, his family works in trades, so it was very much so a like, I wanted us to explore that avenue because not a lot of people talk about it, so I appreciate that you said that. <laughs> Sorry, Bart. Next up is senior capstone projects for the next three projects. Say, good job, Games for Education. Yeah, good job, Games for Education. My name's Leah Mosier. I'm Jamel Flemister. My name is Isaiah Flemister. Uh, this is a story about a spoiled prince mouse who's, who's now sent on a quest to get a, a berry from the woods. He fails miserably, but throughout his journey there, he learns to grow and, and obtain things on his own merit, and at the end, he returns home changed. Wildmouse took inspiration from both Celtic and Old English folk mythology and folklore, and we used the, t the common trope of the spoiled brat in the storyline. Uh, we also took inspiration from one of Aesop's fables, which is the city mouse and the country mouse. Uh, if you get a short summary of that, is that it compares the two lifestyles of the city mouse who lives in civilization and, and the country mouse who lives out in the countryside. And it showed that the country mouse had it better than the city mouse. Uh, any questions? Wait. 
I worked on the f castle scene and the river scene. Uh, I worked on the storm scene and the end scene. So I am in the still forest scene and the cat scene, the cat fight scene. Did you make the music yourselves or is that uh, existing music? Uh, could you repeat that question? Did the music in the video come from you or was that existing music? Uh, that was made by another group, a part of the can uh, in the sound design team. I don't know what branch college they were in, but I know they were somewhere else. DMP Post. DMP Post. Yeah. Hey guys. Um, so, a little bit of, uh, of a harsher feedback here. You, this is the capstone level, and so one of the things that I would have loved to see is like a breakdown, right? Even like personal feelings aside of, of how you feel about the work, you spend a lot of time on this. Like it, it is your semester, and so what does you the best justice as artists, as producers, as all of this, is to still show a breakdown of your work and how you got from point A to point B. And, and once you start to kind of break out into that professional industry, that's what the employers care about, is how did you get from point A to point B, and then tell me about the things that, that happened along the way, right? If the production quality isn't to what your standard is, this gives us an idea as to like what you did as like a process to get to that point. And it also tells you if you have a good process and a good understanding of the fundamentals, there's a lot of value there, right? And so it, it only really hurts your project to not have those things. So I just wanna make that clear. Um, and with that too, it allows you to kind of highlight the things that you are proud of about your work, right? It gives you the, the format to, if like you worked on one of the scenes, it gives you that opportunity to say, this is what I did with this, this is where I'm really proud of this, these are the, the frames that kind of show these principles of animation that, that supports the feelings of what Aesop was trying to communicate in his fables or things like that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I, I would have loved to see kind of how we got to the final product. Um, at, at a capstone level, yeah, the, the, it feels a little bit still like an animatic than a full animation. Because yeah, I'm not getting the sense of the principles. I'm not getting a sense of some of those aspects of it. Um, you know, I like the, <clears throat> the, the cuts and I like the structure of it. it I'm not getting how the story fully comes together. Like I get the premise and then I get kind of like vignettes, but then it just sort of ends on a mouse looking at like a doorway. And some of the shots were held like way too long. Like the one of the, sh the mouse looking at the doorway, it zoomed out for a long time and I'm like, then what happens? It's like, oh, it's over. Um, so I think, yeah, and, and that's why I do kind of wish I would have seen some of the process because I want to see like what, I feel like, yeah, have, if, if I had seen some of the process or, or even, um, you know, if the process would have been more fully fleshed out, I, we could see like, okay, yeah, this is where you maybe should have seen this part and, and give something to critique, but as it is, it's like, oh, there it is, it's the final. Um, so yeah, I think more care in that regard. Um, but again, like I, I like the idea. I like the. I, I wish we were a little further along, and I wish we could have gotten to see more of like how it all came together. And one more thing too, um, when when you say that you take inspiration from like I'm gonna use Aesop's Fables because it's the one that I remember, right? Having slides that kind of like relate the idea of this was the thing from Aesop's Fables that we took and this is the thing that communicates that is extraordinarily helpful. Because if you are doing something that's based off of source material, we need to clear, that it clearly needs to communicate that this is inspired by that source material, right? I, as a, a viewer, should be able to go back there, and if I've read Aesop's Fables, I should say, okay, yeah, that's definitely a relationship to there. Because saying it is one thing, but we're in a visual medium, so it needs to visually be communicated, and un unfortunately, I don't, I don't see the connection. But I also don't know much about Aesop's Fables, so that might be on me.
Okay, so a couple questions here. One, did you, when you guys animated like different shots, were you um, responsible for the entirety of the scene, aka, hey, like for shot one, you did the backgrounds, you did the, the character, and you did like the actions. Was that everybody's responsibility? Or did you break it up like, hey, I did the mouse, hey, I did the backgrounds for all the shots? What was that job uh, division like? Uh, the way we did is that we broke up each scene and we all do everything in those scenes. That, so each of those scenes we all did on our, of our own time and then put, put them together. Okay, so now, because you guys do have a smaller, smaller team, were you guys able to um, either have a style guide or play to each other's strengths in that aspect then? Because let's say if one person wasn't doing as well in characters, was there some sort of reference material that they're able to use because you guys are now dependent on doing every shot yourself? We do have a character design sheet. Okay, and was that also carried over in backgrounds as well? Uh, yes, to the best of our abilities. Okay. That's, oh, that was just something I wanted to know. Anyone else? I guess like kind of the main takeaway that I'm noticing with like all of the feedback on here is show us like your process and this applies to more than just this single presentation but how you present your work when you get into uh, looking for jobs, how you present it on your portfolio. Uh, one thing I think is especially important, like Joey said, is uh, putting in that breakdown of exactly, exactly what your inspirations were, um, where they lie, what your thought process was, what elements you took from the source material, and how you translated that into a visual medium. Um, because like, that's the main thing people want to hear about. Uh, even more so. Well, they'll, they'll want to see the finished product, of course, but uh, they want to know how you think and how you work as a creative, basically. And I think that's it. Um, I think just building off of what we've already heard, I think you op had the opportunity to add two things that were already made in there really quickly, storyboard, animatic, right? Those two things were already done. You could have tossed those up there and then it would have been easy to talk about those things. Um, so I think thinking about the assets that you already have, you're like, oh, we already have that stuff. Well, let's just put that in the presentation. I think if, if we maybe would have even seen some of that stuff first, that would have built up to the animation, because 2D animation is hard, right? That's a, there's a lot of frames. I mean, you're drawing every single frame, so it's hard work. So if you build us up to that and then, and then show us the event of the thing, I think you know, we would have had a, just a little bit more uh, to go with that. So, yeah. Okay. So we've got, we still have five minutes on the timer, but if there's no other questions, any more questions? Okay, so what did you, first off, um, I wanna hear about your guys' thoughts about this. Like what in your animation do you guys feel your strengths were? Like what do you guys feel like you did well on? Uh, uh, I wanted to, can you repeat that please? Um, what did you guys feel like you guys did well on for the animation? What did you like feel happy with doing? So, um, we didn't really have too much to bicker on. We kind of followed Aaliyah's um, um, motion. So we kind of, she came up with the idea and we did our research paper on it. So originally it was gonna be a full story, not a trailer. And I feel like if we would have had a full, like a full um, video, it would have showed, you know, cause of the, one of the things was that he learned to rely on himself and how to do things. I think that, you know, we didn't have the original scenes where he had like servants helping him. He seemed like he was so, um, if we would have had those scenes, he would have came off as more, you know, less reliant on his own self. Um, but I think that we, uh, we didn't argue too much on uh, back in the scope or I would say, 
Yeah, we didn't argue too much on back in the scope or, you know, what do we needed to do, what we wanted to do, what we needed to cut. So I think that we worked well. Not, um, we, didn't, uh, we didn't argue too much on what to do, basically. I'm sorry, you asked what our, like, what do we believe our strengths were? Like in yeah, each like, scene what or, like, did you feel, like, most happy about? And I guess to also add in it, I think Isaiah kind of mentioned, or, um, yeah, mentioned it that, like, if you had, let's say, um, like, what would you improve about this? Okay. Um, okay, so, all right, I'm going to start off by saying that um, as far as my scene, which was the storm scene and the end scene, what I was proud of was probably, like, working with the lightning strikes because I did a bunch of research on you know how fast it's supposed to be, how fast each lightning strike is, and sometimes it you know comes out in just a flash, and then the build up until it finally strikes the mouse. Uh, I'd say that's probably what I was most proud of because it's like you know a build up because you saw what was coming. Mm -hmm. As far as what I feel like we could add on, is probably I think uh, if we were to continue on this animation, we could like show more of the struggle it took for the character to turn into like selfish to like self-reliant, if that makes sense. But, you know. mm, as I said before, I did the castle and river scene and the things that I felt more pr most proud of it were the backgrounds. I spent a lot of time on those. Um, what I think we could have worked on more was the consistency of colors because there are certain parts where they don't match. Sounds good. Our if you wanted to continue, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, so in real-time rendering um, our group, one thing we did probably toward the end is that we made corrections as far as make sure we match color and line work. I think um, re-watching it now, I think we can improve that as well. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Anyone else? That's it? Okay, thank you. I'm Kayla Yuri, and I'm project lead, and I did the artwork for the creatures, the main character, and the animations. I'm Andrew Fortis. Um, I was a writer and level designer and modeler. I'm Zach Taylor, and I was the lead programmer and the UI designer. I'm David Rieger, and I worked as the level designer and play tester. I'm Ira Turner. Um, I worked on the character modeling, rigging, and texturing. Our game Soul Adra is a Nintendo 64 style game that combines both elements of horror and that of uh, Italian folklore into the mix.
Our game, Sola, draws heavily based upon various myths and, and legends from folklore shared throughout Italy. We did extensive research before developing the story for our game to ensure which creatures will fit well within our game and serve a great purpose to pen an intriguing, engaging narrative for the players. With those creatures and their specific stories and lore in mind, along with blending that in with the retro-styled horror-esque title, we uh, settled on pivotal figures such as Gato Mamon, the Cat King, Babao, the Boogeyman, and Patenda, the Well Witch. Um, in Soul Laundry, you take on the role of Vitaly, who is a young boy who is following his mother through the woods when he gets separated from her as he gets distracted by a meowing noise behind him. Um, he turns and is attacked by a cat, Gato Mamon, which is a character from Italian folklore who steals his soul. Um, but Tally is forced to uh, wander through the woods alone and uh, confront shadow creatures. Sorry. <laughs> um, to get it back, he has to avoid shadow beasts and escape the woods that he's in. When we were designing the levels for the game, we were trying to do them from the perspective of Vitaly. Since he's a small child, things seem larger than life, and they're also shadowy and spooky. Um, Vitaly also doesn't have access to a map. Uh, he has to explore the area to figure out how to complete the missions that he finds himself needing to complete in order to escape. When thinking about the uh, systems we wanted for the game, uh, we decided quickly after the direction. Uh, we made a quest system that has four optional or uh, objectives you can do. Uh, there's a kill objective, interact, uh, collect, and location markers. Uh, there's a main quest and side quest that ex uh, encourage exploration. There's also a dialogue system that goes in depth and allows exploration of the source material for the monsters and characters. And then the uh, crystal item that the main character uses, we wanted it to be versatile, yet simple. Um, it kills certain creatures, activates certain creatures, uh, acts as a guide, and can reveal secrets. So one of our goals when making Soul Ladra was to really emphasize the look and feel of a retro N64 game. Uh, we started out with low poly environment assets and continued to build the look of the game around that goal. Um, our inspiration for this comes from the ever growing popularity of indie games that are regularly able to capture this older look and feel. So when it came to designing the um, 3D models themselves, um, it was a bit of a challenge to match both the style and the concept work we had for them, um, just because it, it's a very stylized kind of look when you think about Nintendo 64, um, GameCube style games. So while I was um, working on them, I had um, Google open on the side with a bunch of screenshots of Majora's Mask, which was one of our bigger inspirations for this. Um, one thing I noticed when I was looking at them is that they tend to be almost deceptively complex um, in that they're simple, but they don't look simple once you really actually get into it. Um, the texture work is, um, well, while it's simple, and it's like on one color channel really, um, there's details in them. Um, and like the models themselves are, um, th they have recognizable style to them, is what I'm getting at. There's recognizable shapes, um, distinct shapes, um, things that make them stand out, basically. We'll open the floor to questions. Um, <clears throat> uh, first, I have a question and then maybe uh, a comment afterwards. Um, what is the general time period that this game like takes place? Is this kind of more of like a middle, uh, middle Europe, like early village time kind of time frame, or 
So it's kind of like medieval uh, Italian time frame, kind of like near the Renaissance. Okay. Um, you were talking about stylization uh, just right there towards the end, uh, and you also mentioned how this was inspired by a lot of indie games that are coming up uh, out of the woodwork left and right that are gaining a lot of attention. Uh, something that I think could have gone a really good way in kind of conveying that uh, level of stylization is a lot of the texturing. Um, something that's a really good example uh, I think you could definitely lean on is uh, Lethal Company's stylization. Uh, that has a more like gritty feel, which I think definitely has some air to this. This definitely seems to be a lot more like gritty, uh, old Italian uh, folklore, a lot of which seem to be kind of based in horror. So kind of that general texturing uh, to things would definitely lead a lot of credence to that. At the moment, it's kind of a lot of plasticky uh, blender. It looks like either blender or Maya renders, uh, which kind of makes it feel a little bit more like toyish, if that makes any sense. Um, so it seems like you have a lot of cool assets within your environment. Unfortunately, I couldn't really see most of them. Uh, the lighting is very dark. Uh, how did you guys land on Italian folklore? Because that's interesting. So the uh, inspiration behind landing on the Italian folklore, mm -hmm. there. Upon, oh. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen it really touched upon in media, such as like video games. Um, not that I've seen from indie games or anything like that. So we really wanted to bring to life some of that, because it's kind of like neglected when you look at something like European folklore, like England or anything like that. Italian is one that just kind of gets breezed over a lot. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I would, this was covered, but I would reiterate, like, it's very dark, and, and uh, you know, so, like, earlier there was Snowbound, right, and um, that was a dark indie game that was doing some of these same moves, but you, you were talking about things like, you know, Islands of Light to have the, direct the player and things like that, and I didn't really see any of that in there, and I think that would have really helped this game because it was so pitch black, it was really like, I, I could see that being tougher to move around in and see what was really going on. And then in terms of the N64 art style, I think <clears throat> when, you, when you say you're gonna take on an art style, <clears throat> you wanna be very careful about going all in and studying every aspect of the art style. <clears throat> so you had low poly stuff, yes. N64 had low poly, because polygon limits, right? But like, I didn't really see a lot of texturing. If you look at N64, there's like a lot of those really muddy <laughs> textures um, because it had poor texture processing and stuff like that. But every surface was textured because they wanted to look real, right, in, in a lot of those games. So, because we were just like kind of looking at some screenshots of like everything from Mario 64 to like Hybrid Heaven, which was like, let's make it try to look realistic to like Quest 64. It's like, well, let's see the worst case scenario. Um, Quest 64 is a bad game. Uh, but like, that's, yeah, there's, there is, and then the other thing we were thinking about was like baking lighting, which is like another extra step of the process, which is an obnoxious step. And I hated when I used to have to do it for mobile games. But like, if you really want to get that N64 style, you almost have to kind of go back and do some of those steps, the baked lighting steps, because I think those will really help sell that. And again, if you're starting to look at baked lighting, then you're not worrying as much about like the pitch black darkness. You know, you're, you're kind of getting it up to a certain luminosity. It, it, it almost seemed like, sorry, I'll, I'll go to next. It almost seemed like it was more minimalistic, low poly rather than N64 style. And if you're going to put classifications on on something, like that's the, that's the criteria in which we're going to judge you, right? Um, so there's that. Now, some of the things I think you did well, I like the, the quest system. I like the fact that you could kind of choose what you were tracking at the time and there was a UI element to that. Kind of wish the UI was a bit more readable because it was kind of just like shoved in the top left corner. But 
I mean, you have the system, and making the system is half of the battle, so the UI is just kind of refining that, and then that's readability. Um, the other thing, too, is I'm, I'm having a bit of trouble figuring out some of the design decisions in making it so dark. Um, like, like we were saying, and it was already touched on, so I don't want to beat the dead horse, but there were opportunities where, like, what was in the character's hand? Was that a crystal? Was that a flame? It was a crystal? Yeah. Well, that could be a source of light, and then that could be relative to its health. The more damage that the player takes, the less light that they have to work with, then they kind of feel suffocated by this dark environment, and that becomes, you know, the end of the game is being trapped in that darkness. Still fits the theme, but I feel like there was design space that was missed there. Yeah, just kind of adding on to that is like the main thing behind that sort of uh, PSX N64 style is the baked in lighting, um, especially in the direction that you guys took it. Uh, just prefacing this by like, it's a really hard, did you make it in Unreal? Yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, especially in Unreal, it's a, you, it, it's a pain to like, gut that whole shader system and make it so it works in that style where you have unlit textures, you have baked in lighting, um, which you can kind of get away with for uh, this presentation a bit, but like what really makes it noticeable is the fact that the game's really dark and you, you have very strong, uh, very strong light sources that are simulated and don't really fit in the style. And as a byproduct, you can't really see the models or the characters itself. So it's a little hard to make that distinction, especially with the uh, simulated lighting being as strong and high contrast as it is. Um, I would say, though, like, kudos for the Italian folklore connection and basing the story on a lot of that stuff because it's very easy to fall into tropes. It's very easy, you know, when you're a student, there's a lot of pressure to make something that looks like the things you're consuming because you want to get the job at the place that are making the things you're consuming, right? But, you know, when you hear people from industry, they actually want students to really be inventive, to push the envelope, to try new things. And, like, <clears throat> you know, I think, I would even lean into the Italian folk folklore more, like have more of it. Cause like the game, you know, all did kind of read a bit more like another like slenderish kind of horror game in the dark, amnesia, dark descent type thing. But like, <clears throat> you know, the, the beginning walls of text with not a lot of time to read them, maybe do some voiceover for it instead. But like, I'm like, okay, I'm really intrigued because this is like a different setting, a different set of, monsters, a different set of circumstances. Lean into that more, have more of that, because that's the kind of thing that is going to set your, your student project apart. And, and this is why we have you do the paper in Capstone, is so that you kind of take a beat and then you learn about something new. And I think you did that wonderfully. So yeah, like more, do more of that. Like, and, and if you, you know, if you have time in your career before going AAA, do more of that, <laughs> you know, have, dive into more off the wall things, you'll, you'll discover cool new stuff that'll make you distinct. What were some of the, first off, amazing job. Second, what were some of the, what was, sorry. What were some of the games that inspired the creation of your game? So Majora's Mask, Banjo-Kazooie was one of them, despite it being a more like lighter type game. But anything from like the 64, like Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, Kazooie, Conquer's Bad Fur Day was a big one. So that was one of like the biggest inspirations for the game. Do you ever plan on adding more to the game as time goes on or revisiting this in the future? It, that is the plan. <coughs> We are going to add more to it. We, there's a lot of folklore type monsters we can add into it to expand the forest. Because we had an entire story uh, planned out, but just due to scope, we had to shorten it down. Yeah. 
I loved the Italian folklore part of this. It reminded me of another game that I've played, Black Book. It's not an Italian folklore, but it's about, I think, Celtic folklore. Um, and as you play the game, you learn more about the lore in a way that's not, that feels fun. Is there anything like that in, in this game where, you know, maybe you discover fragments of text or something? Do you learn more about the lore throughout the game? Not in this current version, but that was going to be one of the plans if we were to continue. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. How's it going? All right. Um, our game is called Spit It Out, which is a co-op puzzle platformer uh, which takes place in the future president of the United States of America. My name is Grayson Jones. I was the creative director for this game as well as a level designer. My name is Sarah Reen. I was the co-director and lead programmer for this game. Hello, I'm William Barron, and I was a level designer. Hello, my name is Elisa Kusalaba, and I did the environmental design. Did it just turn? Oh, no, we're sorry. My name is Andrew Weisberg. I am currently the sound designer and the music composer for Spit It Out. Hi, my name is Tolu Kalale. I'm the animator for Spit It Out. So for our research, we focused on two main topics, and that is uh, language development in children, uh, along with the positive aspects that co-op can offer. Uh, so for example, with the language development in children, we found that things like object spatial language, object permanence, things like that develop over time, almost like unlocking skills. And then things like uh, co-op are being used in uh, aspects such as therapy for their positive aspects in forms of like communication and things like that. All right, so early on in development, um, this started as a sketchbook assignment where it was one player uh, controlling two characters with one hand each. One hand was doing platforming while the other hand was controlling the environment that the other was platforming in. Um, and when we came together, we decided we wanted to do a co-op game, so we thought this game would trans uh, translate pretty well, which we were a little wrong about that because we had a power imbalance where um, one player was more uh, held accountable than the other because let's say someone messed up the platforming the other would be blamed because they were in charge of the controls. Um, so, <clears throat> okay, I'm a little ahead. Uh, when, um, <laughs> all right, so, um, oh, right. So the, uh, the controller's blamed. So how we did this, we tried a bunch of different gameplay mechanics um, that had this balance. So there were three main components that we needed to balance, which were the, the accountability of each player, so both players are on the same playing field if someone were to get blamed. Uh, two is the, um, the engagement, like, so no one player should be standing still while the other is doing work. We need to have balance of both. And then the third is make sure the game is fun. And then after like a dozen or so iterations of gameplay, we, um, we settled on the current gameplay, which is uh, two characters in a split screen uh, fashion where, where, uh, where the, uh, the players 
can interact with their own environment as well as the other and solve puzzles to uh, get to the end of each level and spit it out. Yeah, so I'm, I'm real quick, I'm just gonna talk about the main mechanics that we have in our game. So you have a gizmo and gadget system where each player has their own unique gizmos. It includes a, a state change and a value change gizmo. So state changes gizmos are like buttons and levers where it is either on or off and a value change is a gradation between two values. And then that corresponds to a gadget that is in the other player's environment. So that include things like a door, a, uh, a platform, moving platform, you know, something that rotates. And you place these gizmos down on wires in your environment that are color coded to correspond to the gadget that is in the other player's environments. So for example, here you can see our co-op system working. I'm gonna select a gizmo, place it down on my wire, and you see that it opens and closes that door right there. Um, with the main gameplay loop with that being associated with opening and closing, moving things around in the other player's environment, they am doing the same for you so you can get to the end of the level. So for the co-op aspect, that was the most challenging aspect by far, being able to record uh, who is assigned to which controller and then keeping that throughout the entire gameplay is very difficult, particularly in Unity. Unity has a habit of, it's like a parent losing their child in the mall and then instead of finding their original child, they just grab a different child and pretend it was theirs all along. Um, but yeah, so that was what it came to with programming. So for level designs, we originally started out with just sketching them in sketchbooks or using Photoshop or other uh, illustrative programs to kind of make some ideas, just throw things out there, what mechanics we might want to uh, introduce, and what kind of gameplay loops would be interesting and fun. And so we originally played them amongst uh, each other in the dev group. And then after we uh, got all the tools necessary from Sarah programmed into the engine, we put it in the engine and decided what levels really worked. After some play testing, we realized that some feedback was more uh, uh, beneficial, such as the game was really designed around a uh, puzzle oriented, where we found that a lot of the enjoyment came from platforming and timing stuff, such as the toggle blocks or the moving platforms. So we went back and redesigned some rooms to introduce more of that, so that we, because that was what was more enjoyable that we found. Um, and so we also designed the first couple rooms to be more introductory tutorial levels to not only uh, the gadgets and gizmo systems, but also the, just the basic movements and the fundamentals of the game. Um, yeah. All right, for the art style of Spit It Out, we wanted to go for a more <coughs> vibrant, lighthearted, cartoony style. So I started with concept art and got the feel for what we wanted. So the, first, the two levels that we have are Pancreas Playground, which is like a park, and then Stomach Lagoon is a beachy tropical location. So my tile sets went through a lot of phases during playtesting. First they were too blocky and spaced out, then too close together. And now we decided to taper off the middle aspect where they can't, where players can't touch, and made them the darker color that you see. Um, for the backgrounds, I made them uh, uh, layered and uh, tireable, so they're able to be like re replicated, and so they will follow the character as they move. Uh, what else did I do? Uh, <laughs> and then I also made some other um, assets like decorations and yeah. <laughs> so the thought process for composing the music and the sound design for Spit It Out was lighthearted and goofy at its core. So we looked, for, in the case of looking for sounds for uh, Pancreas Playground and the main theme for Spit It Out, we focused on bright tones, bright pads, plucky instruments, and chiptune instruments, just like the kind of nostalgic stuff that reminds you of a good time. And then in the case of Stomach Lagoon, which is our second level, we settled on the same sort of uh, theme there, but we went for a deeper, more resonant uh, theme throughout the uh, level, which is more like guitars, which is more like guitar-y, just more resonant in nature. And Elisa's uh, level design was um, a big inspiration for helping me figure out the, uh, tone of the, the tone of the music in general, and we focused all, basically on all major chords and scales for all of the uh, music. And then for sound effects, we also, it was a little bit of a challenge tackling that, and in doing so, I focused on a two-pronged uh, approach where we used uh, sound cue for finding some sound effects to layer on top of each other and then run through vintage filters, and then also SFXR, which is a really cool, uh, program that was originally made for Ludum Dare, uh, Ludum Dare game makers. 
and it helped them uh, with 8-bit and 16-bit sound effects. And you'll basically be hearing it throughout the entire game, and the hope is that all of it, all of it sort of melts together to provide a pretty good listening experience as you play. We will now take questions. Well, I'm a pretty big platforming nerd, so I definitely love the look of this. <laughs> um, what was your main inspiration? Like, what games were you inspired by? Uh, so, uh, I think the two big ones, well, the big one, there was one big one, which was uh, It Takes Two, um, like just that kind of back and forth between uh, like each player kind of progressing forward. And then uh, some of the Lego games definitely also inspired us as well. Um, but we also tried to take like a, a unique approach because I don't see many co-op experiences. Oh. Are, we, are we back? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so we want to have um, uh, a game where you know pe people are in their own spot, but it still affects the other player as well. So instead of like the same space, they're affecting each other in different spaces. So yeah, you mentioned that uh, It Takes Two is one of your big inspirations in a lot of those other co-op games. Um, and I think a lot of people find that a lot of the fun in those can be found from like, uh, on the occasion, like intentionally sabotaging your partner. Uh, did you find that like you had to intentionally put those in or do you think they sort of like naturally formed in the level creation? Yeah, so from the very beginning, I was a big component of making sure you could let your, you could let the players kill each other. Because for those of you who grow up, grew up with old school Portal 2 co-op, that is legitimately the majority of the fun. Um, I think giving the control to the player of letting them choose how they actually solve the puzzles in their own time is half the fun. And then letting you both have the chuckle, especially if you're sitting in the same room right next to each other, staring at the same monitor. Like, the hilarity of that is priceless. I'll just say that things I didn't expect to hear today, old school Portal 2 co-op. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of just to help lean into that idea of making it imperative that the players can kill each other. Uh, something that immediately kind of popped into my mind when I saw some of that happening in the gameplay trailer uh, was uh, like uh, Battle Blocks Theater, which I definitely think you guys could probably rip some of their level ideas and kind of incorporate them on your own. But uh, a question that I had was I noticed that uh, the dying, they would kind of be respawned somewhat behind where they died. I just kind of wanted to ask a little bit more of how you set that up. Yeah, I'm sorry, could you repeat the last part of that, so the respawning? Uh, how did you set up the respawning so that way they respawned in a relatively safe area behind where they last died? Ah, programming question, let's go. Okay, so, <laughs> um, the way it works is that we have a system set up that keeps track of how far into the level the players are. And once they've passed certain checkpoints, it basically reassigns where their respawn point is. Um, once they've died, it checks, hey, what's my last respawn point? Oh, it's here? Okay, we're gonna go ahead and start the death sequence. Once that's finished, I'll respawn the player here, disable their controls for just a short amount of time, and then re-enable controls. Um, and the advantage with that is that if they end up going back into the level, like backwards at one point, it updates their respawn point. So that way you always have a safe respawn point to go back to. Okay, thank you. So what's the actual goal? Like you appear to have a storyline with the whole future president of the United States. So what are you, like what are you going through the levels for? All right, so conveniently in the story, there's a, um, a spit it out button where uh, when both players make it to the end, they step on a button, which uh, you saw briefly in like the, um, you're pushing a button. Um, they press the button and that makes the, um, the actual player talk or the character talk. Um, and you saw legislation, that was the child's first words. So um, I think, yeah, the, uh, the goal is basically just get to the end and then the, uh, the story reason you're ending, or the story reason that you're finishing the level is to speak. 
Uh, this one is more out, more out of curiosity. You guys said that the, the initial plan before becoming co-op was that one player controlled both. Can you guys explain exactly how that would have played? It's more because I'm really curious because that sounds really interesting. Yeah, so um, the way that um, that would have worked is one hand is controlling the platforming, the other is controlling the levers. Uh, we would want that to be probably more of like a hectic type of gameplay where you're like trying to control two things at once um, and then have like, I guess, faster paced platforming. Um, it'd be definitely more of a challenging type of platformer, but um, it would... It definitely is a completely different pace, but um, I haven't played it because we haven't made it that one. But um, uh, there's, I think there's a lot of potential with that idea as well. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. What were your inspirations for the two little guys that run around? They kind of remind me of the old Nickelodeon shorts, purple and brown, a little bit. Yeah. So they, uh, I just made two little guys, blue and pink shaped guys with like kind of opposite shapes. One was like rectangular, one was circular, and just kind of put eyes on them and gave them like little uh, characters. Yeah. Fair. So um, you guys were intending this to be like couch co-op. In the future, would you also think about doing like a multiplayer so you can play with your friends in other places or play with random people and try and cooperate with them? Yeah, that's, a, that's definitely a system that we would be interested in implementing. But I also think the, one of the main aspects of our game that works so well is that the couch co-op, um, especially since we wanted to focus on a game that uh, has you directly communicating and being with somebody that is literally right next to you. Um, a lot of the research we found with the use of co-op in therapy is that it's used as like a communicative tool between two parties that might be at odds. And so forcing people to actually work together um, is a really interesting aspect. So that was the main reason we focused on exclusively co uh, couch co-op for this development cycle. So first of all, really cool. Uh, and I like it a lot. And I like it so much that I'm going to use it as an opportunity to point something out to everybody here, uh, especially to my Games for Education students, which is this is so like when we do Games for Education, I'll be honest about it. I always, it's always like a rough semester because, you know, it's not what people, it's not the dream, right? You know, and that's, there's always a little bit of like uh, uh, convincing. It's like, yeah, you know, we're going to do this kind of game design and stuff like that. <clears throat> and and uh, I think, it, and I think everybody did a really wonderful job. But I think this is where a really good example of what happens when you take that mindset of like, Again, now you literally did, like, you're focusing on therapy and childhood development and these really cool things, right? But you marry that so much into, like, that's just a cool co-op platformer, right? And, and it's, like, so under the surface. Now, if, if uh, again, uh, Grace couldn't make it today, but if Grace were here, they would probably talk about, you know, lessons they've learned in their own game development where, you know, with Snowbright, with their studio, they were trying to do, like, very on the surface, and this game teaches you this. And then people would be like, I love that idea, but we're not gonna give you any money for it. You know? But then they're like, well, let's make a, a cozy tea party tabletop RPG. And then people were like, I want that. I will give you all the money for it. And it's a game about conflict resolution. But that's not anywhere, but then you resolve conflicts, right? So I think that's what's brilliant about this is that you've internalized this it's, it's the engine running the thing, but it's not on the surface, but it's totally the engine running the experience, and I think that's fantastic. So kudos to you on that. Um, piece of feedback, the environment art's not quite at the same level as the characters of expressiveness, and I think it needs like one or two more passes. And I would look at like Pizza Tower uh, was brought up. Maybe a bad example because it doesn't use traditional tiles, but like Earthworm Jim-ish kind of like that era of platformer, um, or like there was a Rocco's Modern Life game on Super Nintendo, which is not a great game, but it has like that, you know, Joe Murray style to it. And like, yeah, so look for s examples like that um, to really kind of bump up the environment art, because I think it also needs that sort of like manic presence. I mean, you made a game with Grayson, so yeah. it, it needs that like wacky Nicktooniness to it.
Yeah, and there's there's other ways to to push that too. I feel like um, in, in those moments of of betrayal, right, that you are able to achieve in that couch co-op, there's always room for like expression in the other character of like, oh no, what did I do to my friend? Or like, aha, you know. Um, but yeah, the big point was with the environments, there did feel like there was a bit of disconnect. And also in the design space, you have like a brain and a body, that's the route you chose to go down. You could look at maybe utilizing different assets for the brain, maybe it's like the same puzzle, but like a different coloration to it, kind of like mimicking that you see it like through the ocular, maybe it's a more brain-like landscape or something like that. Um, it didn't really feel like beyond the art of the characters, there was anything really different between the two characters. And if you take inspiration from It Takes Two, typically the puzzle puzzles that one group solves are vastly different from the other one. And I think maybe something like that, if that is going to be your main source of inspiration, to start to think, like, can we make things either visually look different or mechanically act different? Nine times out of ten, it's easier to do the visuals than it is the mechanics, but it is a, it is design space to look at. And I will point out, a lot of this feedback you're getting, too, on, like, stuff to shore up is because I'm looking at this, I'm like, yeah, I'd buy that. Like, yeah, that's, like, I want that on my Switch, like, to play with my kids. So, like, Shore those things up and then release it because it looks awesome. I do want to say really quickly um, to touch on Joey's point. Um, the uh, the actual gameplay for each is kind of like so the body does a little more platforming while the brain does more um, of like I guess the puzzle aspect of it, which isn't shown fully in the trailer, which we can adjust. But um, there is like still some of that balance of the character you pick does matter a little bit. So yeah. Um, that's great, I love to hear that. I think saying that maybe in the elevator pitch or something there to communicate that just a bit clearer would be great. But the fact that you have that, awesome. Love to hear it. So I just wanted to ask, what are your plans moving forward with this game? Well, I think we all like the game, so um, we haven't fully discussed what we want to do, but I think there's a lot of potential moving forward. We unfortunately did have to cut two levels for the sake of scope, but um, we for these levels we had different, like I think, for, in terms of mechanics, we had to probably cut like 75% of what we wanted to do originally, so there's a lot of, uh, we could definitely elaborate on it a lot more if we wanted to, which I think we do want to, but uh, we'll have to discuss after this, but there's a lot of levels we could make. And, and I will say like, so some of, the, some of you on this team were shared also with the Our Town team, uh, and, and that's another game that should be released fully. Um, so just make sure you do self-care if you decide to to release both, because I can tell you as a person who has worked on two games at once, don't do it. <laughs> it's a bad idea. So yeah, uh, but, but I mean, I don't know, both of those are really awesome, so yeah. Yep. Thank you. Now we're headed out to the lobby for the reception and playtesting and apparently cookies. And punch. And punch. We got punch. Yes. This is the last class. We don't meet up ever again.